So we can. Yes. So we continue the journey with Jesus. Oh, thank you. Jesus, and we're continuing the journey with Jesus and the disciples towards Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Mark, we've made that turn. Uh, in chapter 8, we make the turn. And so now everything kind of that Jesus is saying really is pointing towards this Jerusalem moment. Uh, this moment when they're going to enter into the, the city and all of the things that are going to happen after that. The way Mark has written this, this is kind of a, a bit of a, is all the build up. You know in the movie when you know where you're gonna get to that moment and there's the action picks up and there's more going on and the story feels more complex for, for a good portion just before we get to the, the last 15 minutes when they explain everything that's happened. That's where we are right now in the Gospel of Mark. We're in that place where we're building everything up. And the disciples are conscious of this change. They know they're going to Jerusalem, but they still haven't figured out why. They're still trying to, they're still living in this model of what Jesus is doing that is not anything to do with what he's been talking about. In their minds, they are still, they still understand that they're going to head to Jerusalem and somehow, somewhere, even though really the core group is probably these 12 guys and, and some others, there, there's not an army following them. But in their heads, in their heads, they still think there's an army somewhere. That terror is going to rise out of something. Whether they think that when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, what he's actually intending to do is to preach in such a way that he will incite a riot and a revolution, I don't know, but they're definitely of the understanding that something monumental is about to happen when they hit Jerusalem. And they're right. Something monumental is going to happen. It's just not what they think. And so they're walking along. You can just see the 12 of them, you know, with Jesus, walking along, heading towards Jerusalem. You know, they're taking this long journey to Jerusalem. And they're arguing among themselves. I mean, we know they've been arguing because they've been arguing in the, last, in the last couple of chapters about a whole bunch of stuff. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, decide to separate themselves from the pack. If you can just imagine, Jesus is walking slightly ahead, thinking to himself, they have no idea what's going on. They have no idea what's going on. And they're all arguing in the background. James and John separate themselves from the pack. <coughs> Run up to Jesus. Slide up beside him. And say, mm. So Jesus, when this all kind of comes to a head, and you're sitting in glory, remembering that they do not see that as kind of his death. They see that he's going to sit on the, the throne of, of Israel. So when you're sitting there in all of your glory, we volunteer to sit in your left and right hand side. Who we'll step up? Jesus goes, oh. <laughs> you know, face palm, face palm for centuries to the outside. Oh. He realizes that they still don't get it. They're still struggling with this idea that what he is offering, this kingdom idea that he is presenting before them, is so radically different from everything that they know that they're still thinking in the cultural worldview that they've grown up in. And that's not a surprise. Like, we all have that. Right? We all have a worldview that is shaped by our culture and our family. You know, when you, when, and, and it's one of the, the joys for me, anyway, when I travel, right? When I go places different, when I go to somewhere different and I'm, I'm kind of wandering around, it's always interesting to watch other people's worldviews, right? Even if they clash with mine, it's just interesting. 
And of course the question, I did sociology in my undergrads, so the first thing I want to do when I see someone have a different world view from me, um, the first thing I want to kind of sit down and go is, well tell me why. Tell me why you do, because it helps me understand them better as a person. Like I may not agree with like the way they behave around things, but tell me why you have this world view. Help me understand you better. And that's kind of what James and John are operating out of. They're operating out of this world view that the Messiah of Israel is going to come and save them from this oppressor. And that this Messiah is going to come and cause a, cause a revolution. That there will be warfare. And that they will overcome their oppressors and they will stand triumphant in Jerusalem when they get there. And Jesus will be declared King of Israel because that's another term for the Messiah, the King of Israel. He will be declared their ruler and they, as faithful followers, they have separated themselves from the bickering pack behind them, stepped up and said to Jesus, oh, we will stand beside you and we will do everything you need us to do if we can sit on either side of you in the highest positions of honor. But Jesus' worldview is not like that. Jesus' worldview is something very different. He sees his role not as one who's going to come and bring yet more conflict, but rather that will change the world by changing us as individuals and changing us as communities where we will start to have a different worldview that will cause a different type of revolution. Not a revolution of warfare and blood and hatred, but a revolution of love. And that's a very, and in fact for, for the, the Romans and for many empires and for many people in power, that is a terrifying thing. Because people will do a lot for love. We will do a lot for love. <coughs> Some of us were, um, uh, I'm a member of one of the local rotaries, and, and on Friday we had an amazing speaker. Were you? I knew you were there. You were there, Doug. I knew you were there, Doug, yeah, because Doug got to me. Of course you were there, Doug. You're rather sure. Um, and we had this amazing young man come and speak about uh, the work he does. And he's involved in peace literacy. So helping people learn and understand peace as, as, a, as a habit, as a, as a way of being. And, and he advocates that peace as a, as a way of existence should be taught to children and to adults, but in particular to children, is, is as we would teach maths or English. Right? So giving people, giving us the skills to work together in better ways, to give us language and behaviors and processes that work towards a peaceful reconciliation of things rather than the dominant system which is, we have now, which is if you have an argument or a concern with something, you can usually get into very acrimonious arguments and, you know, at the ultimate level, you get into warfare, right? And he advocates something very different. And I was thinking, and when he was talking, I was thinking, yeah, that's 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 the Jesus model. In fact, he quotes Jesus in his presentation. That's the Jesus model of how the world should be. That in fact, if we are equipped with the languages and processes of peace, we will overthrow the tyrants. And those who, who oppress in a way that they will not see coming. And it will be a different type of revolution. It will be a revolution of care, of sacrifice. And, and this young man talks about, he, said, he asked some really interesting questions. He asked the question, what are the basic human needs? What are, <coughs> John, go home. Oh, okay, I'm not alone. What are the basic human needs? Food, shelter, water. Love. 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 So those of us who are at Rotary on Friday, what are the basic human needs? Belonging. Belonging. Love. Love. 
not food, water, shelter, and um, all of the physical. And it was really interesting when he was explaining this. I'm kind of going to just give him over to my sermon. I actually kind of thought, I wonder if he stayed for the weekend and chill back. I could come and preach. Because <laughs> it fitted so well with this piece. Uh, um, just this whole sense of like the world is not as we think it should, you know, the world that Jesus sees is not the world that we think it is. It's a very different world. We have been conditioned, and, and someone's going to have to help me remember because it went right out of my brain. It has, as often happens between that chair and here, <laughs> things go out of my brain. There's a, there's a, a matrix of, of meat, and there's a name for it. Thank you. It's always good to have the smart people in the room. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> what thing is it? So it's called, it's, see again for me? Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about our needs being water, food, all in shelter, right? Well, this young man is, and at the top is self actualization, right? So you have to meet all these needs in order to get to self actualization. Right? Which is where we kind of know ourselves, and we can zen out, and we can sit in the lotus position and know everything. Yeah, it's never happening. <laughs> no, 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 lotus position and zen out. So, so that's kind of like this, this, um, this pyramid. What this young man is saying, and Doug, can you help me remember his name? Paul. Paul Chappelle. Paul Chappelle. What Paul Chappelle is saying is that actually self-actualization is the most basic need. If you love someone, you will sacrifice everything for them. If your kids, think about your kids. When they were, for those of you who are little, maybe your grandkids, think about the kids. Think about Peppa. If there was a threat upon our building right now, who would we all save? We'd save the kids, right? We'd, we'd do everything to save the children. Why? Why would we save the children first? Hmm? Well, they're defenseless, but... Our maternal instincts. Our, our instincts as parents and grandparents, and what is that instinct really about? Love and protection, right? We love them, right? We love there's a there's a primeval love for kids, our kids, right? And when that gets challenged, what happens? We turn to bears. We turn into mama and papa bears, right? Like, you know, don't ever threaten anyone's kid. <laughs> the claws come out, the teeth are bared, and it's like, don't eat them, right? Love is more powerful. So when we love someone, what will we do if we don't have water, food, and shelter? What will we, what will we try and do for them? We will go and find them. And we will do anything to find them. Right? This is what this guy Paul Chappelle was saying. What happened? Now here's a hard one, because most of us are in community and we're in families, so this might be a little tougher, but you know, we, you know, try and strip away that sense of love for, for ourselves, our families. What happens, what, are, what would be your driving force to get food, water, and shelter if you did not love anyone? Well, we become selfish, but would you actually have a driving force to f seek food, water, and shelter? What would be your driving force? Selfishness, selfishness is not a driving force. Okay, so basic survival might be the driving force. What are you surviving for if you have no family, friends, or community? Self-preservation. Why? Why do you need self-preservation if you have no family, friends, or community? Pardon? If I take away your friends, family, and all of your community, and I put you on a desert island, why would you want to survive? 
Why would you want to survive? What would be the point of survival? Instinct? What's the instinct that would make you want to survive? Self-love. There might be self-love. Belonging. Belonging to what? There's no, you have no family, you have no friends, you have no community. What is the point in surviving? Maybe fear. fear. It is much harder to define what you would survive for if you have nothing to live for. Okay, flip that around. You're on a desert island and your family are, are, are on like the mainland. What would you do? You would do everything to connect with them, right? You would, you would hunt for food, you would build shelter, you would figure out how to build a boat, all kinds of things. Why? Because you, you need them, and they need you. Right? So that's the power of love, right? Love is actually what drives us. The need to belong to community, the need to, to connect with other human beings is actually what, this is what this guy Paul Chappelle was saying, uh, was saying on Friday, the, that's actually what drives us as human beings. When you take all of that away, we actually have no, um, no uh, nothing driving us to eat, nothing driving us to live. <coughs> Those are the things, and Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that love, that the need to connect in community is the thing that drives him and, and drives humanity. And so when he's talking with the disciples, and when they come up and they're like, so Jesus, can we sit in your left and right hand side? When he talks about a sacrifice, what he's really saying is, are you not, yeah, you can have the cup I drink from and you can have the baptism I'm, I am part of, but are you willing to make the sacrifices for it? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself in love for this community? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for humanity? Because that's ultimately what's going to have to happen. That's ultimately what's going to have to happen in this storyline is, is that Jesus is going to have to sacrifice for the love of humanity and he's going to ask the disciples to do the same. And it is that drive, that drive of love so strong that we would sacrifice our very lives is what's so darn terrifying for the Roman Empire. Flash forward to the 21st century, if you look at the driving forces of our powers and empires right now, the last thing they want people to do is love one another. They will ridicule people. They will, they will attempt to say that, uh, uh, that being LGTB is unnatural. They will do anything to say that how we love one another is against the will of God even. To break down those bonds we have. Because those bonds of love are stronger than any other thing in our lives. Because for those bonds of love, we will literally crawl across the room and throw ourselves between an attacker and a child. When we will throw ourselves in front of those who cannot speak for themselves, we will throw ourselves in front of those who struggle, and we will throw ourselves in front of those who cannot stand up to oppression, who cannot stand up to warfare, we will literally throw ourselves in front of them as Christians and say, we love our <coughs> humanity so much, and God loves us so much, that we will sacrifice ourselves for you. When James and John ask to sit on the left and right hand side of Jesus, they have no idea what they're asking for. Because to stand that close to Jesus 
means that you are in the firing line of every tyrant and every empire and every person who would bring you down as a human being. It is much safer to be off in the arguing crowd on the back. But if we choose to stand beside Jesus, if we choose to step into the fray, if we choose love, then we know that we will sacrifice. But we have purpose and we have meaning. And those are powerful enemies of tyranny and oppression. Those are the most powerful enemies to, to tyranny and oppression that are anywhere in the world. Purpose and meaning of our lives are the reason that we would throw ourselves between someone who would want to harm one of our kids and that person. We would sacrifice our very lives for our purpose and our meaning. And that's what drives us as human beings. And that's what makes us Christians. Because the purpose and being that we have been given is a love for our brothers and our sisters and a love for ourselves. And that love will stand up to power and tyranny every time, and it will win. Because when Jesus is resurrected, when love wins at the end of the day, power and tyranny look at itself and ask, what did we do wrong? We could not get rid of him. He's come back. And not only has he come back, but he's come back more powerful. And instead of one or two standing on his left and his right, there are many. And they too are standing up to us. And they may rattle their swords and yell much louder. But they cannot and will not destroy us for even a single candle in the darkness brings light. 